In the early hours of December the 7th, 1941, the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service sought to crush the US Pacific Fleet in one of the most daring surprise strikes in history, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Leading the assault was a fighter aircraft that would dominate the Pacific theater in the first two years and instill fear into the hearts of Allied pilots. The Mitsubishi A6M-0, Japan's long-range carrier-based fighter. Saburo Sakai, one of Japan's top fighter aces, noted, The Zero excited me as nothing else had ever done. Even on the ground, it had the cleanest lines I had ever seen in an aeroplane. It was a dream to fly. When it first appeared over the skies of China in July 1940, the Zero outmatched any aircraft it faced, and it possessed unparalleled advantages of speed, maneuverability, and a simplicity of design. I'm Liam Smith with Agent Smith Voice Productions, and in today's history video, I'll discuss the rise and fall of the legendary Mitsubishi A6M-0. In 1937, the Imperial Japanese Navy was looking for a replacement to the A5M fighter. On October the 5th, 1937, planning requirements were sent to firms Mitsubishi and Nakajima to start the preliminary design on the Zero prototype. The first prototype featured a two-bladed propeller and was powered by the Mitsubishi Zuisi 13 engine, which only produced 780 horsepower and was under the specifications. All future models of the Zero, after the first two prototypes, would be operated by the 14-cylinder air-cooled Nakajima Sakai radial engine. Nakajima eventually pulled out of the project, as it considered the new requirements laid out by the Imperial Japanese Navy to be unachievable. However, Mitsubishi's chief designer, Jiru Horikoshi, believed that the specifications could be met, but only if the aircraft was as light as possible. Horikoshi's design for the new aircraft was ingenious. The Mitsubishi A6M-0 sacrificed all forms of protection, durability, and complexity in order to make a more effective and extremely agile plane. The aircraft was built with a top-secret aluminium alloy called Extra Super Dura Aluminium, which was lighter and stronger than other alloys provided at the time. However, the alloy on the aircraft was also prone to damage, so the pilot would have to use a special foothold that could be released with a button when needed. There was no armor protection for the engine, pilot, or other critical parts of the aircraft, along with the decision to not include self-sealing fuel tanks on the earlier models. This caused it to easily catch fire if an enemy round managed to rupture one of the fuel tanks. Before I move on, I want to share with you this small clip of an interview with Saburo Sakai, who explained one of the Zero's weaknesses. Mm. 
という形ですからあやられたらもうライターのように火がつくと、うん、そういう弱点があったですね。<音声>Zero first encountered Allied fighter planes, it gained a fearsome and legendary reputation. Much of this contributed to the incredible training of the Japanese pilots. At the outset of World War II, they were among the best in the world. In one such incident in April 1942, 36 Zeros engaged 60 RAF fighter planes over the British colony of Shalon. For the loss of only one zero, the Japanese shot down an astonishing 27 RAF fighters. During the opening conflicts in the Pacific Theatre, from the attack on Pearl Harbor to the end of the Dutch East Indies campaign, the A6M Zero could easily dispose any of the Allied fighters sent against it, such as the American F4F Wildcat and Curtis P40 Warhawk, claiming an astonishing 12 to 1 kill ratio. It even proved to be a challenging opponent for the nimble British supermarine Spitfire. As Lieutenant General Claire Lee Chenault stated, the RAF pilots were trained in methods that were excellent against German and Italian equipment, but suicide against the acrobatic Japanese. 
One of the unique dogfighting tactics that the Japanese pilots executed with the A6M0 was called the looping left twist in. Japanese flying ace Konami Harada stated, It took advantage of our great maneuverability at the slowest part of the loop. You turn very tight, and the opponent slips in front of you. It's a move our senior pilots in the Navy came up with. Very difficult. If you mess up, you stall. You turn at the plane's most maneuverable speed to make the opponent slip ahead. It is one of the ultimate moves in dogfighting. Of course, United States Navy pilots were well aware of that. Even the Spitfires and Hurricanes refused to dogfight. If there was one thing the Americans and the Japanese pilots emphasized on during combat, it was to be the first to attack, to see the enemy, gain an advantageous position, and take the initiative. The vision of a Zero pilot was one of the keys to the aircraft's success. Saburo Sakai explains. その、Sakai Zero is now on public display at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. I was fortunate enough to see this magnificent machine in late 2019. Here is my photo that I want to share with you. Despite the incredible agility and performance of the Mitsubishi Zero, the fighter would eventually become obsolete against more advanced aircraft, such as the P-51 Mustang and Vought F4U Corsair, that used hit-and-run tactics with superior speed and firepower. The Allies had desperately wanted to get their hands on the Zero. The opportunity would present itself in 1942, and you may be thinking I'm going to discuss the famous Akutan Zero crash landing, in fact, this particular aircraft wasn't the first of its kinds to be discovered. On February the 19th, 1942, during the infamous bombing of Darwin, a Japanese Zero A6M2, piloted by Hajime Toyoshima, was hit in the oil tank by a single 303 rifle bullet. When the engine seized and the propeller sheared off, Toyoshima crash-landed his damaged aircraft on Melville Island, northwest of Darwin, whilst returning to the aircraft carrier Hiliu. Toyoshima was taken prisoner by indigenous Australian Matthias Ulongawa. He was the first Australian to take a Japanese prisoner of war on Australian soil. Ulongawa then transferred the prisoner to the RAF guards stationed at Bathurst Island Aerodrome. Toyoshima used the alias Tadeo Manami, claiming he'd been washed ashore in an attempt to prevent capture. But after being interrogated by police who saw through the ruse and located his downed aircraft, he was taken as a prisoner of war, where he eventually died whilst attempting to escape in the famous Kora prison breakout on the 5th of August 1944. His aircraft was the first Zero to be found relatively intact on Australian soil. Some components of the aircraft, including the engine, canopy, and tail, were recovered for intelligence purposes. The remainder was left at the crash site. The aircraft is now on display at the Darwin Aviation Museum. The second Zero to fall into Allied hands was the famous Akutan Zero. On June the 4th, 1942, the Japanese attacked the American facility at Dutch Harbour. One Zero piloted by 19-year-old Tadayoshi Koga was hit during the raid, severing its oil line. Unable to return to his aircraft carrier Ryuju, Koga decided to land his aircraft on the island of Akutan. Akutan had been designated for emergency landings, with a Japanese submarine in dock waiting to assist pilots who had been forced to land. Koga tried to land his Zero on what he believed was a grassy meadow, 
but in actual fact was a marsh. When he touched down, the Zero's main landing gear bogged in the mud, and the aircraft flipped over onto its back. Kogo's wingmen had specific orders to prevent a Zero from falling into the hands of the Americans. They were reluctant to destroy the overturned aircraft because they believed that Koga was still inside the cockpit. Unfortunately, Koga's neck was broken when the aircraft had flipped over. His wingmen eventually had to depart to return to the aircraft carrier. The Zero would remain in the marsh for over a month until it was spotted by a US Navy PBY Catalina out on boat patrol on July the 10th, 1942. The aircraft would return the next day with a recovery crew. They discovered Koga's body, which they searched for any intelligence information before burying him in a shallow grave close by. The team returned to Dutch Harbour and reported that the aircraft could be salvaged. The next day, another salvage team was dispatched to recover the Zero. This team gave Koga a Christian burial in a nearby knoll, but they lacked the right equipment to transport the aircraft. On July the 15th, a third recovery team was sent to Aquatan with the heavy equipment necessary for transportation. The Zero was freed from the mud, hauled to a nearby barge, and transported to Dutch Harbour, where it was righted and cleaned. Eventually, the aircraft was loaded onto the USS St. Mahil and transported via barge to the Naval Air Station North Island near San Diego, where they initiated repairs on the vertical stabilizer, rudder, flaps, and propeller. The Hinamura Rounder was replaced with American insignia. It was not until the 20th of September 1942 that the aircraft had its first test flight, with Lieutenant Commander Eddie R. Saunders at the controls. He flew the Zero in 24 test flights from September the 20th to October the 15th. Saunders discovered that the Aralon stiffened up its speeds exceeding 200 knots. The Zero rolled easier to the left than to the right, and the engine cut out under negative G acceleration due to its float type carburetor. Allied pilots would brutally exploit these weaknesses during combat. What is interesting to note, however, is that although Saunders claimed the engine stalled whilst performing negative G maneuvers, this was actually due to the US ground crew assembling the engine incorrectly. In fact, there was no other report that I could find that mentioned engine failure under negative G. In a post-war interview, Saburo Sakai personally denied any such issues linked to the engine stalling. The Aquatan Zero would eventually be destroyed in February 1945, when a Curtis SB-2C Helldiver accidentally lost control and rammed into it. Several pieces of the aircraft remain in museums today. By late 1944, with the A6M-0 being completely outclassed by American aircraft, Japan needed a new tactic if it was to hold back the American advance. The Japanese commanders called for volunteers to join special units. They were called the Kamikaze, or Divine Wind, and drew on the Japanese Bushido Code of Honor that it was better to die than to live as a coward. They were suicide units. Kamikaze aircraft were essentially pilot-guarded explosive missiles, purpose-built or converted from conventional aircraft, unlike the well-trained Zero pilots whose numbers had declined rapidly over the course of the war, the Kamikaze pilots lacked the basic understanding of how to handle the Zero, and many of them crashed into the sea, well away from their targets. Some Japanese military personnel were highly critical of this policy. One of the top scoring aces, Tsuzu Iwamoto, refused to engage in Kamikaze attacks because he believed he thought the task of the fighter pilots was to shoot down enemy aircraft. Saburo Sakai also declared the kamikaze program as brutally wasteful on young lives. The first kamikaze attack occurred on the 25th of October 1944, where the escort carrier St. Lowe was sunk and two others badly damaged. The most deadly attack was on the 11th of May 1945, when two Zeros, piloted by Kayoshi Ogawa and Sazeo Yoshinori, flew their planes into the USS Bunker Hill, killing 372 personnel and wounding 264. 
Around 19% of kamikaze attacks were successful in hitting their targets, and over 3,800 pilots died during the war, with more than 7,000 personnel killed during the attacks. In conclusion, the A6M0 was an incredible feat of engineering, and in the hands of a skilled pilot, it was a lethal dogfighter. It debunked the myth that Japan couldn't produce planes or pilots capable of challenging the white colonial powers in Asia. A couple of years ago, I made a video claiming that the German Fokker Wolf 190 was my favourite fighter of the Second World War, but I think my perspective has changed. I really admire the Zero for its capabilities, and I think it's one of the most beautiful looking fighters of the Second World War. Thank you so much as always for watching, I really enjoy making these World War II videos. I have some exciting new content coming up on the channel, and I'll be able to upload more frequently as well. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure you give it a like, don't forget to subscribe, and click the bell icon to be notified of upcoming content. Liam Smith, with Agent Smith Voice Productions. Until then, stay tuned. I'll see you next time.